Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Maggie. I'm officially a third year medical student and I was a professional MCAT tutor for years and I run this channel and this business with my brother, John. Our whole shtick on this channel is to make the MCAT accessible and affordable for anyone so that you don't have to spend thousands of dollars on a big name test prep company to score well on the MCAT and to get into medical school. We first started off going through the AAMC free tests like the sample test and the free practice exam and breaking them down and giving you guys better explanations while also showing our test taking strategies in those videos. But now we've already finished the sample test and most of the free practice exam and so I'm actually going back and doing the standalone questions. I finished the CP section with my last standalones video and now I am going to be starting the bio biochem standalones in the AAMC sample test. That's the unscored one. As I said in the last video, a lot of what we do on this channel revolves around strategies and flow charting and active reading and things like that. Good, just good test taking strategies, especially for the MCAT, which is mostly passage based. But for these standalone questions, all that you really can do is to simplify the question stem as down as far as you can get it. Once you get to that little morsel of basic science that they're really asking about, then you can really say, do I know this science or not. So standalones are really great for identifying content gaps. So without further ado, let's get into it. The BB section of the sample test. This is starting on question 15. All right, so here we go. Number 15. Organic acids denoted by HA are only minimally deprotonated when added to pure water. And it gives us a generic equation for the dissociation of an acid. When dissolved in blood, however, HA fully dissociates. Which factor can be used to explain this discrepancy? So I don't want you guys to go into the answer choices immediately. I want you guys to simplify the question stem first and think about what you want the answer choice to be. Because really, we're told they only minimally deprotonate in water, but they dissolve fully in blood. So really the question is, what's the difference between water and blood when it comes to the dissolution of an acid? Well, what are some things that we know? Water is a pH of seven. Blood is a pH of 7.4. Okay, that's the first thing I thought of when I read this question. Would an increase in pH cause this acid to dissociate more? Yes, right? Pretty much the only thing that's really gonna matter on the MCAT for the dissociation of an acid is going to be the pKa of the acid and the pH of the solution that it's in. That's like it. And at a pH of 7.4, which is the pH of blood, that's higher pH, right? That's less acidic, that's more basic, that's fewer protons in the solution. And therefore we're essentially decreasing the right side of this equation. And so it's gonna run to the right. That's Le Chatelier's principle. If you wanna, if you wanna make every MCAT question Le Chatelier's like I do, then that's Le Chatelier's principle. So the correct answer choice here is going to be A. And what A is saying in blood, the concentration of H is maintained at low level, levels by other equilibrium that's just saying that it's a higher pH essentially and I know what some of you guys are probably thinking you're thinking it's 0.4 points how does that possibly make it go from minimally deprotonated to fully dissociated but what I need you guys to remember is that the pH scale is a logarithmic scale and so like like one point means it's you know, from seven to eight, okay, that pH difference, that's one point on the pH scale, but that's like 10 times more basic than a pH of seven would be. B says that this reaction in the blood would be uh, coupled to ATP hydrolysis, and likewise D says that enzymes are used and to catalyze this reaction in the blood and neither one of those are true. And there's a much simpler explanation and the MCAT loves like pH, like, like if, it, if pH is even in partially in the question, like make sure to be paying attention to it because the MCAT just loves it. And C says in I, the ionic strength of the solvent medium is much higher than pure water. I'm not even sure what that means, but like we're not really talking about like ions. We're talking more about, or we're not talking about like ionic bonds or anything. We're talking about acid base chemistry and dissociation of protons. So A is going to be our best answer choice there. The next question is question 16 and it says in oxidative phosphorylation cytochrome C acts as a, and this is a memorization question, unfortunately. You just, I remember coming across this question and I didn't know it and I had to put it on a flashcard and I probably never use that fact again. But you know what? Cytochrome C acts as a one electron carrier. Now, something that I think will help you with the memorization, it wouldn't help you normally, but I think it may help you going forward if you're like, well, shoot, I didn't know that, I need to memorize that, is the structure of cytochrome C. 
It may help you remember, it may not, but I just brought it over here just in case. So you'll notice that this is a heme moiety. Like this looks the same as the heme that's in hemoglobin. And there's an iron in the middle of it and that iron has a two plus charge. And I, I read up on cytochrome C very briefly because I was like, I hate memorizing. Like what's some way that I can not memorize this? And so cytochrome C, when it's going through the process of oxidative phosphorylation and it's like shuttling electrons over, it actually um, switches between the oxidized and the reduced form of this iron. And so at some points it's carrying three positive charges and at other points it's only carrying two. And that is similar to how heme works. It is the, uh, the conversion between ferrous sulfate, which is two plus, and ferric sulfate, which is one, I mean three plus. So how do I, okay, let's say ferrous is two plus, ferric is three plus and the way i was taught to remember this is that fair us us as in two people you'll learn later on in medical school that when heme actually goes through this transition from um, a ferrous two plus state to a ferric three plus state that's actually bad and that's a pathological state called methemoglobinemia that's not important for this question but i just want to give you guys a lot of framework because sometimes these isolated facts have no place to rest in our brain and so they just pop right out but now you can see cytochrome c and be like oh 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 yeah that one's that one that has the heme moiety it's just like hemoglobin and i remember that there's a ferrous and a ferric state and so there's only one charge difference and so it must be only a one electron carrier i hope that helped and not hurt just then but that was just a memorization question i hate those i'm sorry they do pop up the next question i think this is number 17 says which primer is most suitable for pcr this is just something that you need to remember in general for dna strands the dna strands with the highest gc content and what i mean by that is that literally they just have more g's and c's than than a's and t's that confers to higher stability and so when what this question is really asking is just like what's the most suitable or i mean sorry what's the most stable primer so you literally just pick the one with the highest gc count which is d the reason why and i'm sure most of you are not confused about this but the reason why the gc content uh, as it increases, it increases the stability is because the, the um, hydrogen bonds between G and C, guanine and cytosine, there's three hydrogen bonds between those two. They look like, you know, this. They look like that. Whereas between A and T, there's only two. And so literally there's just less, there's just less hydrogen bonds that are holding those two bases together. So it's just not as stable as GC bonds. And that actually does make a big difference when it comes to the stability of DNA. The next question says, in which phase of meiosis does non-disjunction occur? So you guys remember meiosis when you have these guys and they're all lined up in the middle and then they get you know pulled to the side. Let's see if I can do this. They get pulled to the side like this and like this. And they kind of go to their separate cells and then they'll get and they'll go through cytokinesis and they'll break off into two different cells yeah all that okay so non-disjunction happens when these two actually they're these two that are lined up in the middle these homologous chromosomes they don't split and so they'll each go off into the cell like that and this is how things like trisomy 21 occur and stuff like that so the 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 fun thing is that you can actually have non-disjunction in meiosis one or meiosis two remember meiosis two would look like this um, and so you could move this one over here and this one over here you know these uh, sister chromatids or whatever you move them over but you could actually have one that doesn't disconnect and so that would also be an example of non-disjunction the important part here is not the one or two you can completely overlook the one or two here when would non-disjunction occur it specifically is going to occur in the phase of meiosis where the the homologous chromosomes or the sister chromatids are breaking apart and going to the different poles going to the different i think there's centromeres that are pulling those in so that process that i illustrated right here by breaking these apart that would be anaphase remember your cell cycles your it's prophase uh metaphase anaphase telophase pmap prophase is the beforehand it's when it's doubling its dna and stuff like that and then metaphase is when it lines up in the middle mm and then anaphase is when it splits apart to either side and then telophase i think telophase is like when the nuclear membranes reform around the two different poles i'm not really sure and then cytokinesis is like when the whole cell pinches 
off into two different daughter cells. Look that up for sure. I haven't done that since bio two, been a minute, but that's, that's that. So the answer here is anaphase. It doesn't matter if it's one or two, it could be either one. The next question, and this is actually like further down, this is number 28, says yeast cells can grow under, under either aerobic or anaerobic conditions. If the same concentration of glucose were used to grow two different yeast colonies, would the growth rate be faster under aerobic or anaerobic conditions? So this is comparing and contrasting aerobic and anaerobic conditions. And the big difference between those two is obviously that one requires oxygen and one doesn't. But the other big difference is that aerobic respiration gives you so much more ATP. It's like 30 something. Anaerobic is literally like two. It literally gives you like two ATP because it's just glycolysis. That's it. So aerobic is a lot more efficient if we're using the same concentration of glucose because we can do a lot more with that glucose. Glucose can either run through glycolysis and then kind of get pooped out as alcohol or, or lactic acid or whatever, or it can go through aerobic respiration and it can actually be further broken down and broken down and broken down until you get like water. So that's really squeezing all the energy out of glucose. So would the growth rate be faster under aerobic or anaerobic conditions? I see students, I feel like this is a pretty simple question, but I think students like see that it's simple and they're like, this is the MCAT, it's not gonna be this simple, it, and they overthink it. It's going to be aerobic, aerobic because a much greater amount of ATP would be produced to provide energy for reproduction. That's it, full stop. You don't have to overthink this question, and I know it's so easy to overthink things, I know. But let's look at why uh, the other answer choices are wrong. A says anaerobic, I mean, that's the reason why it's wrong, but it says because the final product alcohol would contain more energy than the final product of respiration, which is H2O. The final products are byproducts, they do not matter. We are not getting any more energy out of the final product. In fact, we want the final product to be really low energy because that means that we got all the energy out of the glucose to begin with. So that's wrong. B says anaerobic because the cells would not have to produce the enzymes needed for the citric acid cycle. I'm guessing if the yeast cells can grow under either aerobic or anaerobic conditions that one, they'd probably already have those enzymes. And if they didn't for some reason, I really, I just, I cannot tell. It's literally like 15 or 20 more times more ATP in aerobic respiration that I feel like they're not gonna mind making a couple of enzymes. D says aerobic because the CO2 produced in fermentation would be toxic to the culture. I don't think so. That's Isn't that how bread is literally made? Like bread, like yeast and CO2? No, I don't, I don't think that's true. So yeah, we're gonna be going with C here. Don't overthink it. Okay, that's all the questions that I'm gonna do for today because like I said, as of this week, I'm officially a third year medical student and therefore I am busy, unfortunately. But let me know what you think of this video. If you liked it, then I will continue to do these standalone videos. Make sure to hit this channel with a like and subscribe and check out our description below to see all the cool things that we have going on. We have books for sale, we have courses, we have a collaboration with New World, like cool things are happening with IFD. So go check it out on our website. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.